All right, we're underway. So, Hannah and her sisters, could it happen again in 2021? Let's get to it. So, the answer is, we don't care. I just watched a commercial this morning on one of the news programs that says, I'm in great shape and I'm running every day. Boom, shingles doesn't care, right? So, no matter where you are on the coastline, Hurricanes don't care about your forecast in May. There are some things that larger planners need to take into consideration, such as FEMA Region 6 or FEMA National, because that covers a lot of real estate. But the reality for all of you is never forget, it only takes one, and try to build that resilience by becoming hurricane strong. So at the bottom, I say here, this never changes and we had Hannah to remind us in 2020. Now what has changed is the people in this picture, only about a third of them still work in our office. So uh, we do intend on updating this picture soon and hopefully we'll give you the old hurricane strong symbol and uh, use that in the future presentations, whether this year or beyond. So no matter what you see in the next 15, 20 minutes, always, always go back to this. This is what matters most. But because you asked, the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season outlook is out. <laughs> and it's 13 to 20 named storms, averages 14. By the way, these averages did change. They now use a 1991 to 2020 30 year cycle. So the number of named storms went up a little bit by two, the number of hurricanes went up by one. You can see if you take the mean of these forecasts, it's above those averages in all cases. And therefore we have a 60% probability that the season will be above normal and only a 10% probability that it would be below normal. We'll explain why that is as we move forward here. As far as tropical cyclone names, well, another May and another May where we've lost the first name. Last year, as you saw, we lost two names in May. Uh, this year we had Anna, which I think was listed as a subtropical storm didn't last very long, and near, I think it was near Bermuda, uh, but still it just shows that if you have the ingredients in place, even in May, uh, you can get a named cyclone. Now you're probably asking, well, didn't the season begin on May 15th? The answer is no for now. I say for now because what we did do, and you'll see this in the next presentation, is begin the tropical cyclone outlook uh, on May 15th, and boy, did that come in handy when it came to not only Anna, but looking at that thing in the Western Gulf that had been the thunderstorm complex uh, just one week ago today. So uh, yeah, May 15th seems to make sense for starting the discussion, and you're probably now asking, well, why not May 15th for the start of the season? That is under discussion. Uh, the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva, Switzerland is having this discussion as we speak, and it's quite possible that for the 2022 season, uh, that the season that we may be starting on May 15th, which changes a few things, although not the way we're doing our disposition as much. Uh, we may move this, uh, this these workshops back a little bit into May. Uh, but if you remember, the Hurricane Preparedness Week was May 9th to 15th uh, this year, and it has been that week for the last few years. So it looks like we're getting a, a leg up on that preparedness week coming right before the start of what would be a new start in the season in May. But for 2021, it is still June 1st. So we're almost there, uh, but we're not quite there yet officially. So the 2021 outlook in a historical perspective. Now, what you're seeing on these bar charts is the accumulated cyclone energy index or ACE. And of course we mentioned ACE earlier, and it kind of explains how ACE is calculated here. But uh, you notice that we had a, a relatively quiet period in the late 60s to the mid 90s, and then in 95, boom, we have all this activity uh, represented in ACE, but ACE, again, isn't just the only thing out there. The number of storms matters too. But we use the ACE to give an idea that you could have a lot of energetic storms or a lot of storms producing the energy, one or both, uh, this season coming up. So uh, you can see all these high numbers in this current cycle, which goes back to 95. And uh, again, the low activity area is 71 to 94, that was 25 years. 
in a high activity uh, era that lasts 20 years. This one has lasted about 30, uh, 25 also, and we're possibly heading up towards 30 years of a cycle. They do last that long on occasion. We've seen this going all the way back to the 1850s. So the average ACE is around 106, somewhere between 91 and 106. This year's forecast is for somewhere between 110 and 190. And again, as you can see, the high activity period in the Atlantic. So this kind of gives you an idea that we're in the high cycle and the forecast for this year keeps us in that high cycle. <clears throat> so we just showed you the NOAA forecast and that's the one that we rely on. We like to say we save the best for last being NOAA coming out near the end of when all of these groups send out forecasts. You can see a whole number of them now that do this. But what's, what's interesting about the NOAA forecast and everything else you're seeing here is for the most part, there's not too much of a deviation. Now, some groups only put out a single number forecast, and that's a little bit difficult to do. If you can nail the number perfectly, boy, it's a million dollar proposition there. But most folks do put out ranges. And if you look at the ranges, they're all sitting on these higher numbers than the average. Now, this is the old, um, this is high activity of being 12 and above. Now it's more like 13, 14 and above. This is based on the old average that was in, in this chart before the new ones came out just a few weeks ago. But the bottom line here is that you are above the normal and the, even the high activity line here in all of these cases, except perhaps two of them. And Noah's right there at 13 to 20. So if all these groups agree, we're all using the same science baseline, you can be pretty confident that the season should, again, should end up normal to above normal. And you saw that with that pie chart before, with only a 10% probability below normal. So you're all probably most concerned about hurricanes, right? So we have the hurricane number, and the average comes out to be eight, the 30-year average is seven. Uh, the NOAA average, if you take six to 10, that ends up being eight. So again, we're all on the same page. This is a combination, by the way, of university, private sector enterprise, and government agencies that are making all these forecasts. So we move on from hurricanes to major hurricanes, which you, of course, could, are concerned about too. And there's a little more range here, uh, but that range is based on the fact that we have a smaller y-axis scale that goes zero to seven. So in general, these ranges are also fairly similar between three and four in terms of the number. So, you know, three to six or six to nine or seven to 10. And the average comes up being four, um, the NOAA number is three to six, so that's 4.5. So again, right in the range of all these groups that are producing forecasts. So when you see that kind of consistency um, in all the groups, that means there's a pretty good confidence in what the season will bring. And then accumulated cyclone energy, the same deal. There's your high activity number. You can see all these bars are either above it or cross it and none go into the low. So everything is sitting on high activity, the red or above, um, which again, you know, means that we're all looking at the same playbook when it comes to the science. So let's talk about landfall probabilities for Cameron County. And why are we using Cameron? Well, that's where our biggest population base is, where we have to really deal with the storm surge as well as the wind and everything else that comes with it. Uh, there are probabilities available for Willesee and Kennedy, but we just choose Cameron because it's easier to show. Now, this chart's going to be hard to read if you're looking at the small monitor, so I'll read it off to you. All that the increased number of forecasts in the basin shows is that you give a little bit of an increase to the odds, or in this case, we like to call it probabilities, of certain values of wind reaching the Cameron County coast. So, the probability of one named storm making landfall in the county, that means a direct hit, is normally six. I believe this may be based on the 81 to 2010 cycles, which is okay. We did change it with the higher numbers, so this number may be a little bit different in this value in parentheses. Uh, but 10.8 does exist for this year as a probability. So it's up a little bit, but again, 10 versus six, not all that much, but it just shows you that yes, there is an increase in odds. Uh, our direct hit of a hurricane, Again, normally 3.6%. 6.6% is the forecast this year. Last year, if you look at the region of the valley in deep south Texas, that number would be higher. And of course, Hannah did hit the region, but it was not a direct strike on Cameron. Uh, one or more intense hurricanes, that's category three or greater. 
These numbers are very low, but they're close to double the very low. So it's just a doubling of that to 2.7. Now you get the tropical storm force wind gusts in the county. This number gets a little more interesting because now you're up to over 50%, whereas normal, you're about one third. So a one in three chance on a normal year, now you're more like a above one in two chance. So maybe this is the year of Alex. Maybe this is the year of another Hannah. Maybe this is the year of Hermine, which was a tropical storm. It was just shy of a hurricane. I don't know the answer, but those odds are higher, as you can see. And then the hurricane force gust in the county, a 19 versus 11. Again, that's nearly a doubling, so it's not too bad. It's still 2 in 10, but it's above the 1 in 10 that's normally seen. And then a category 3 gust, of course, 115 or more, it's still very low, but it does go from 3.9 to 7.1. And then, of course, the 50-year county data here are, are kind of interesting. Um, when you go over 50 years, what's the probability of having a hit directly in the county of anything named? Well, it's almost 100% in 50 years. And to have a hurricane, it's 85%. So um, that's the long-term probability when you accumulate over the course of 50 years. So let's get to the why. Why is NOAA's forecast, or heck, why is everybody's forecast above average this year? Well, we continue in that positive Atlantic, Atlantic multi decadal oscillation, or AMO, which began in 95 and continues for 20, 20 to 30 years. I say 25 to 30, it's more like 20 to 30. Uh, but either way, it's favorable and it continues that way this year. The El Nino Southern Oscillation is likely to remain neutral, leaning La Nina. What I mean by that is the value may stay below zero on the index, which if it gets close to minus 0 0.5, it gets close to a weak La Nina. Um, and being neutral lean La Nina, that is a favorable condition through the peak of the season. And I'll show you a graphic as to why that is, why both of those two bullets are. And then the sea surface temperature is expected to remain above average in the development region. They're already there and will continue so. And once again, that is a favorable. So we have uh, three friends, if you will, of hurricanes here, the tropical cyclones, and uh, no enemies on this particular chart. Doesn't mean there won't be enemies from time to time that could show up in an individual week or two. But for the season, this is what we're basing it on. So when you're in the positive phase of the AMO, it's a hurricane friendly, again, friendly for hurricanes, not really friendly for people. Uh, climate conditions. So you have the warmer ocean, reduced wind shear. That's key. Remember, we say the enemies of hurricanes are wind shear, dry air, and of course, the fuel being not as warm as it needs to be. If you've got warm water, but low, uh, high wind shear and uh, low moisture, you're not going to get much out there. So in the positive AMO, you tend to have the warmer water, which is a friend, but you also have reduced wind shear. And look at this, the stronger, wetter West African monsoon. That's the moisture you need. So it all favors things coming or developing off of Africa, moving into the main development region. And at that point, where they go, nobody knows until the actual atmospheric pattern decides to figure out where they're going to go. So, um, but as we saw last year, and I don't have a slide on it, we had, I think, five or six storms at once out there in the MDR, which quickly got us from the, uh, you know, the phonetic alphabet or the named alphabet into Greek alphabet which was amazing how that all worked out there in uh, mid to late September. So where is El Nino right now? The El Nino Southern Oscillation. We've been in La Nina uh, from really last July, August, September, all the way through February, March, April. March, April, May is going to be right on the line. If we reach uh, below or I guess above, uh, minus 0 0.5 will be in neutral. And that's uh, right now we're at minus 0 0.2. So May is definitely going to be um, in the uh, neutral zone, but March and April may still be just high enough to keep us right around 0 0.5 or minus 0 0.5. So we'll see. But either way, we do expect at least April, May, June, May, June, July, and probably June, July, August to all be in this neutral value. They probably will be negative, almost like they were in 2020. We saw what happened in 2020. So this is another favorable situation that, uh, we're going to see again in 2021. So there's the forecast. The blue lines are La Nina. Uh, La Nina. Uh, the uh, gray bars are uh, neutral. And you see the red is El Nino. There's very little El Nino showing up in not only the uh, official CPC and IRI forecast here issued on May 13th, but also in the climate forecast system version two, which is 
relatively reliable when it helps to figure out these things by a good aggregation of information it uses. And it shows the rise to just below zero, that neutral phase in early to mid-summer, and kind of sneaking down towards a weak La Nina by the end of summer into fall. So again, this combination here is favorable for a more rather than less Atlantic tropical activity. So, and there we go. So Enso neutral coming out of La Nina, uh, more wind shear in the Eastern Pacific, uh, cool and dry conditions. This is relative, by the way, it's still a warm water mass out there near the equator, but it's relatively cool and dry over top of it. And then the low wind shear uh, that's not produced by energy out here, which tends to produce that wind shear farther east, doesn't exist now because of that AMO and the ENSO neutral, uh, weaker wind shear, better trade winds, and less atmospheric stability, which act on that deep moisture coming out of Africa and moving across the region, right? The main development region. So it's all in play here uh, when you combine the AMO uh, with the ENSO circular, uh, ENSO oscillation being La Nina, La Nina, eh, La Nina uh, going to neutral, then leading back to La Nina. And there's your ocean temperatures. These should uh, start animating, and they do. Uh, the Gulf is very warm. Of course, you can see that one area from last week's thunderstorms here and other storms that we've had. Uh, you know that May has been wet in East Texas all the way down to the valley. It's good news for the drought. It's also cooled the waters temporarily. But look at the southern Gulf, Bay of Campeche area, all the way out to the Western Caribbean. It's warm. The main development region, circle in red, it's warm. And the reason we got Anna, maybe a little bit because of these warm waters out here. Look how warm they are. In some cases, um, eight to nine degrees Fahrenheit or three to four degrees Celsius of what they normally should be. And then of course, this uh, red band here is the Gulf Stream. So that's always some degree of red or some degree of uh, yellow to red color when it's above average, but uh, a little bit of blue in here, but this is well north of the tropics. This is the area of concern. Starting off warm, so it's going to stay that way uh, based on everything else we've shown you. So all the ingredients are in place. So let's talk about how the storms move. So in 2020, this was the mean steering pattern. Now I'm using around 18,000 feet, but some people can use 25,000. It's okay. It's generally the same idea. And this is the steering of the atmosphere in the northern, uh, the continental United States into Canada and down into the tropics so the, in the area uh, from basically Bermuda westward. So notice we have high pressure ridge across the Southwest, which did help suppress the monsoon and really kick their drought in the gear last summer and fall. Then we had the Bermuda Ridge, which extended west into Florida. Um, now you've probably heard me speak about La Canicula. Now when La Canicula is in play, we'll show you what that looks like next. These ridges are shifted east a little bit. And that changes everything. In 2020, because the ridges shifted west, we only had one East Coast significant event. That was Isaias. Other storms that were in the mid Central Atlantic were, were recurving well away from the East Coast. Of course, we had those earlier ones. We had Thay and we had um, the early season one, not forgetting the name of it, I think it was the A or B storm last year off the Carolina coast. Well, those are different. That's an early season setup because of old thunderstorm. Uh, Kyle also, by the way, old thunderstorm complexes that induce some swirl. And this is the main steering pattern during the peak of the season. So uh, look where it goes. The back edge of that ridge, that westward extending Bermuda Ridge into Florida, is in the Gulf of Mexico. And the westward displacement of this <clears throat> southwestern U.S. high, or I like to say canicula high, which is typically when canicula phase over into eastern New Mexico, the Permian Basin, down into Coahuila Province, Mexico. Here it's sitting on the uh, New Mexico-Arizona border into Sonora and Baja. So in between, the flow goes. And where did all those storms go last year? 12 in the Gulf, right? Nine made landfall in the U.S. I think it was, uh, was it eight Gulf storms made landfall? Either way, you had a whole ton of the Gulf, and that's because the steering was perfect for the Gulf of Mexico. That was 2020. What about 2021? Well, the mean peak season pattern from 91 to 2020 is actually more in line with La Canicula. So this is from August through September. And the ridge is more located over the Permian Basin and into Chihuahua, Coahuila, and a little bit of southeast New Mexico. The Bermuda Ridge is displaced east of Florida, not over Florida. So you tend to get two circumstances, a lot of recurvature 
maybe to the east coast of the U.S., more likely out to the open ocean. But down here, what do you get? Veracruzers around the Canicola Ridge and on into Tampico at its northern extent, but more often Veracruz State coming across the Yucatan. And we've seen a lot of this. I think there's been 13 Veracruz events uh, before we finally got an event nearby. Uh, couple, I think it was Harvey. Before Harvey, we had in between um, Ike, or 2010, I think between Alex and Harvey, I think we had 13 or 12 storms that went to Veracruz. And that's because we dominated uh, much of the last decade uh, with a canicula ridge in the peak of the hurricane season. But as we saw in 2020, there was a shift. And what about 2021? Can we predict that pattern this year? Well, I got bad news for you. We can't. <laughs> Uh, this pattern in May that we're seeing is definitely not a canicula pattern. Where's the ridge in the southwest U.S.? It does not exist. But when you have active energy in the atmosphere in the spring with no ridge there, whether it's out you know, in New Mexico, Arizona, or in the canicula position, what happens? This energy is displaced to the south and is producing what? Rain and lots of rain, and it's destroyed our drought, which is really good news for the Rio Grande Valley. We were in extreme drought just a few weeks ago, and as of next, uh, as of Thursday, as of tomorrow morning, we will be in no drought, so, or no dryness, and that's because of this pattern. But does this tell us what's going to happen in August and September, and even July? Unfortunately, no. We do have some outlooks that do indicate that it might look like that or somewhere in between that and that. The ridge could be somewhere in between here, which makes uh, forecasting the Gulf of Mexico storms really, really, really hard this year, I think. So uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. And if you'd like to see that uh, three-month outlook, that's the summer outlook that does include August, um, I can show that to you during the break that we have coming up later. So now you know, what next? Well, it's still about water from the sky. Note the rainfall. I've got Cameron County here outlined because I originally gave this part of the talk to the, the, the Cameron County group on May 14th, about a week ago. Um, but notice Western Cameron County, 15.5, uh, 16.85. This was the 2018 unnamed event uh, where we had tropical waves out there that slowly moved westward and produced days and days of rain. Then this event was a single event over uh, the course of a night that produced um, upwards of 10 inches of rain, Western Cameron, Eastern Hidalgo, same areas, right? And then we had Hurricane Hannah uh, extended into the post Hannah event. Uh, by the way, it's not 5.49, it's 15.49 at, at the sugar plant, the sugar growers uh, on the county line there. But lots of 10 to 15 inch rain events for a third year in a row. Uh, these were all 1 in 100 plus probability events in three consecutive years. So please, 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 if you're planning for um, drainage improvements, do not work off of a 1 in 100 probability. It may not be the case. Uh, you don't want to work off of that kind of a, a level because you won't get enough done to cover what needs to be covered. Remember the old saying by meteorologists in the 1920s, Texas, a state of perpetual drought broken by the occasional, parentheses, devastating, close parentheses, flood. Well, here we are in uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley, three years in a row. So water from the sky needs to be watched. Well, what else? We showed this earlier, Lara, Beta, Delta, Zeta. Look at the coastal flooding on the beach. Uh, these waters going all the way up to or into the dunes, depending on how narrow your beach was. So here on the line here from South Padre Island, there's work to be done. Um, replenishment work to be done, number one, and just overall preparedness work to be done to be ready for perhaps more of these coming this summer. Um, we think at least $5 million in erosion costs, and again, think about what a true storm surge might do to these areas. Remember, Lara made landfall in southwest Louisiana. It was well over 200 miles east of our coastline, but as it got farther northwest and strengthened, it radiated swell that was able to flood uh, all these locations here on the beach, including where I was standing at Wada Wada Resort. Beta was never a hurricane. It was a tropical storm that lollygagged about 100 to 250 miles east of our coastline, but it was working with 
astronomical high tides in late September and was able to just keep on pushing and pushing water onto our beach. These were the highest tide levels we saw since Hurricane Ike, but fortunately I didn't see any breaches of the seawall, meaning uh, any significant property damage outside of the erosion that we had. <clears throat> and then Delta came. Uh, Delta was just um, uh, two weeks later from Beta, and it moved due north right across a buoy that we uh, have that NOAA operates 200 miles east of South Padre. Uh, the eye wall went over at maximum intensity. It was, I think, uh, category three at the time. Uh, it made landfall, I believe, as a one, two. Uh, but at that time, or just after, this is the water it put out on the beach. In fact, it was overnight. It was the worst of it as it was moving pretty quickly. But a lot of the high water kept on going through the early to mid-morning hours. And for a third event, I had it was the fourth event, by the way, we had coastal flooding. And then we thought we might be done. And then late October comes along. We're in the king tide period. And here comes Zeta into Louisiana. And it didn't take much swell given the flattened beach and given uh, the high tides that we already had at the time of year being the astronomical high uh, that we pushed this water uh, into uh, the, the edge of the dunes. Uh, flooding the beach once again. So this could happen. You know, we could see storms in the Gulf and go on South Padre. It's certainly a possibility once again. So what about next? What else do we know? We know that wind can damage, um, heavily damage colonias, especially newer colonias that have stick built structures, unanchored trailers, poorly fastened roofs, uh, you name it, they have it. Once they're developed and established, we do see much better building construction, but until then, it's not there. There were dozens of houses or structures, residences like this that we saw, and hundreds that had partial roof damage or more, you know, that may have made them temporarily uninhabitable. So consider how close Hannah's inner eye wall was, and it did go over these areas of Hidalgo County. Now, was it hurricane force by definition? No, the sustained winds were not. 74 miles per hour. Were there some hurricane force gusts in elements in the eye wall when it got to San Carlos? Maybe. Um, we think that in exposed areas it could have touched that, but our rating because of the damage we saw was closer to 65 to 70, which is high end tropical storm force, not hurricane. Are our communities ready for this? Um, can we do some resiliency rallies in the next couple of months? whether it's at a community resource center, at a church, I don't know where it may be, but to get people in there, such as Lowe's and Home Depot and McCoy's and um, your, your Ace Hardware stores to show people how easy it can be and how inexpensive it can be to do enough resiliency building to protect them from these winds. Now, category two hurricane, that's gonna be hard, but a high end tropical storm, I think we can do this and really save some of these properties from at minimum partial roof damage and at maximum full demolition. So something to consider with your communities to promote the public safety aspect of building resiliency. So how do we do that with the Weather Service and beyond? Well, we've got some resiliency building information as well as other preparedness information at this website here, weather.gov slash WRN slash hurricane dash preparedness. You can just look at National Weather Service Hurricane Preparedness Week and you'll come to this page. And what's great about this page is, um, rather than just talk about the, the storm surge and what it might do, it actually is all about preparedness. And the very first section is about knowing your risk. We all have different risks. We, as a weather service, are providing threat information. The threat of 75 mile per hour wind is X high, right? What that does to a community is depending, dependent on what the community's overall risk is, down to the individual homeowner or residential risk. So those buildings before right here, know your risk. This was 65 to 70 mile per hour wind that did this. Tropical storm force wind gusts did this. They have extreme risk to destruction. Whereas this other home back in the background here, anchored down trailer has low risk to destruction, okay? So we need to get that message out for people to understand from you know, working with things like a fire, right? Threat hazard identification risk assessment, all the way down to understanding how individuals assess their risk. And we have that on the hurricane preparedness page. We also have a little bit of it in our hurricane guides. These guides are uh, linked here. 
But you'll also find them linked at our news headlines on the front of our page, weather.gov slash RGV, where you can get a book read version of the guide. And you can click on the PDF, print that, and then uh, save it on your coffee table or show it off in your uh, facilities uh, as we start seeing more people knock wood as the COVID pandemic hopefully begins to recede more as we get closer to the peak of the hurricane season. We have affiliated partners that provide some great preparedness information too. <clears throat> the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes, or FLASH, has hurricanestrong.org, and as I say below that, build your resilience here. So there's the front page of Hurricane Strong. You can hashtag it and find it that way. A lot of great stuff. You can see folks from the Weather Channel here. Here's Jim Cantore and uh, Jen Carfagno on the morning show uh, doing the Hurricane Strong symbol that we did before. So lots of great information. And of course, you have ready.gov, which again is a multi pronged, multi agency consortium on readiness for just about everything from fire to flood. They have a great section on hurricanes too. And by the way, it's also in Spanish. So both of these sites have a lot of great information on Espanol, as does our Spanish hurricane guide. So between all of this, you should have a lot of great information to arm your public uh, with being ready and safe for the season. So to close out, bottom lines, another active season is forecast, chances of a repeat of 2020's numbers. Remember, 30 storms total, 13 hurricanes, six majors, slim to none. Now, can we get big numbers? Absolutely. Can we have 20, 22, 23? Yes, we can. And uh, that's just something to, to look at from a large scale planning perspective, such as that FEMA Region 6, the state of Texas, or uh, FEMA National. So more activity equals higher odds for any U.S. coast, but odds for our coastline for a direct strike of a hurricane are low to very low, as you saw in that uh, earlier slide, which we can make available uh, later on. Although we sustained a direct hit in 2020, and this is probably the most important point right here, Though we sustained a direct hit in 2020, it doesn't mean we're no longer due in 2021. How many people have come up to you, like have come up to me and said, aren't we due this year? And it was, you know, 2018. Aren't we due this year, 2019? Like, no, there's nothing to do with due. So as I say here, doesn't mean we're no longer due or due in 2021. Being due has no bearing on what the atmosphere might do, D-O. So there's nothing that says that we couldn't have Beulah or Allen or another Hannah or worse, the 1933 Labor Day storm this hurricane season. You know, just because we had Hannah, we're off the hook for 12 years. No, we're not off the hook at all. So to close out officially here, it only takes one, be hurricane strong. And with that, 